Hi, everyone. I'm Seven Investing founder Simon Erickson. And this morning, we're talking about several of the biggest tech trends taking shape in the world. You're already familiar with most of them, autonomous driving or artificial intelligence or the Internet of Things, but we're going to be looking at some creative and untraditional new strategies on investing into those later this morning. My guest is Sean O'Hara. He's the president of Pacer ETFs. Pacer is an ETF issuer with more than $5 billion of assets under management. They're based up in Malvern, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia. Sean, thanks for joining Seven Investing this morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Sean, you have described the four horsemen of the internet, which is artificial intelligence, streaming, e-commerce, and autonomous driving. We're pretty familiar with those trends and the largest companies that are a part of each one of them. But as an investor, what intrigues you and, and how do you think about investing in these types of trends? Well, you know, technology has been driving the markets here lately. Um, you know, five stocks have basically been dominating and most of them are tech names and, 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 and embedded in this business. But what most people don't understand is that the, the technologies you spoke about uh, all are not possible unless there's a critical infrastructure built out to support them. So as an example, you know, uh, Amazon, uh, Google, Microsoft, all competing in the cloud business. And, and the cloud is where all computing in the future, by and large, will take place. And it was, it, and the cloud is going to drive those technologies like the Internet of Things or streaming and e-commerce. But what most people aren't yet aware of is that the cloud is basically a building, a data center that is filled with racks and racks and racks of computers. And in most cases, the cloud providers aren't manufacturing those buildings. Those buildings are being manufactured by specialty real estate companies like Equinix or Digital Realty or Cyrus One. And so without that critical infrastructure in place, those technologies can't go forward. So we built an ETF, SRDR, that basically focuses on the data centers, the fiber optic network, which is really where the information is going to flow. It's like the super highway for all these bits and bytes. And then the cell phone tower companies, which are critical to this infrastructure as well. And we sort of like to think of it like we're the landlord for the fangs. And so, you know, if we're all stuck at home, working from home, doing these webcasts, binge watching our favorite, e you know, streaming uh, service, whether it's Netflix or Disney Plus or whatever it happens to be, what most people don't understand is that, that that information is coming from a data center someplace um, and embedded in that data center right next to the racks that push out the content, there's probably an artificial intelligence computing network that's actually trying to figure out like what your preferences are. So when they push out suggestions, they say, hey, you might like these five movies. That's all artificial intelligence. And it all relies on that same publicly traded real estate network that's data centers fiber optic networks, and then the cell phone tower companies. And what we're learning, I think, in this environment is that we're not quite uh, built to capacity. And as these things continue to grow, we're going to need more and more and more infrastructure. So we're really, um, on the tech side, we're invested in the tech business. I mean, obviously, we have products that own the queues and own all these big names in other areas. But this is a, a kind of a diversifying story for people who think tech is going to be the driver, but want to be diversified away from owning just the straight out equity names. You can participate in that growth by owning publicly traded real estate. Let's double click on those cell phone towers that you mentioned. And I want to talk about 5G because 5G is in the headlines everywhere. Uh, Sean, how big of a deal is 5G and what applications do you think are going to be the biggest beneficiaries from this? Well, 5G is a big deal because it's all about the, the ability for, from, for one computing network to move the information to your handheld device or to communicate with your car, for example. Like, like, like I like to say, like I drive home every day from work. I can tell you where the dead spots are on my coverage on, the, on my way home. It's Upper Gulf Road once I make a left off of King of Prussia Road, right? And so we, we can't have uh, autonomous vehicles unless we have a, a bigger footprint for the coverage and unless that coverage can move more data. Um, and so that's why 5G is such a critical component. Um, it, you know, it's a part of the technology story. It's a smaller part of, the, of an overall bigger theme that we think of here at Pacer ETFs, like the Internet of Things and streaming and e-commerce and artificial intelligence. But it's certainly critical to the infrastructure if we're going to have autonomous vehicles, for example, or if we're going to want to watch uh, or download or use our handheld devices or our iPads or whatever tablet we're using that's not directly connected to a network someplace that it might be 
connecting via a uh, a cell phone tower connection, so or cell phone connection. So it's a it's a big deal. And, and Crown Castle and American Tower are the two big players in that market. There needs to be an enormous amount of additional um, cell phone nodes placed on these towers. So you're going to see four and five times those little. They're sort of white uh, rectangular discs, if you will. If you look up and see a cell phone tower, there's not enough of them to get to where we need to, to for the density of coverage that we're looking for. You're also going to start to see them in, in kind of you know strange places. You're going to see them on traffic signals and on the top of buildings. And one of the holdings in the ETF or two of the holdings that are kind of interesting um, are two companies that people wouldn't think of as traditional tech names, and that's Lamar Advertising and out, Outdoor Media. And so those are just big giant billboard companies. And they're converting themselves into dual purpose companies. They're going to continue to operate the billboards as we're driving across the highways. But what they're also going to do is connect the fiber optic uh, wire to those towers and electricity to those billboards and put cell phone tower nodes on those. And if you think about, you know, what they cover, they basically cover the vast highway network across the country. So that's a secondary play in the, in the 5G world. Mentioning those cell phone uh, tower operators again you know like you mentioned a lot of these companies are taking the capex on their balance sheet they're renting that out to the telecom companies on a per customer basis based on the bandwidth that they would need you mentioned american tower and crown castle i know that those are two very large players in the oligopoly of this industry there's not a whole lot of companies at the top but they own the majority of market share is that what attracts you to this industry sean are there certain things the economics or the oligopoly structure it's really interesting to you as an investor in these types of companies. Well, I mean, think of it short term, long term. Short term, what's what, what's attractive to me is that that the components or the constituents in these ETFs are not uh, saying that they're going to withhold all guidance between now and the end of the year. They're actually reaffirming it in a lot of cases. They're increasing their guidance between now and the end of the year, which means that in this environment where the economy is shut down globally, so we can stop the virus, they're actually operating uh, at. at at a profitable basis and getting more profitable every day. So, so short term to me, I like that. Like I like to invest with certainty as opposed to uncertainty. Long term, we believe that these are critical, uh, you know, infrastructure uh, 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 providers that are necessary to have the kind of growth that we're looking for. You know, it, it, we started in the technological revolution from having everybody connected to the internet. And when we are done, it's going to be everything's going to be connected to the internet. And it's starting that you're starting to see it in your house every day. You know, everybody's probably got a ring doorbell now that's got a video component attached to it. So you can see whether somebody's stealing your Amazon package or not. <laughs> so um, we just think long term, it's very, very early in this cycle in terms of the amount of infrastructure that needs to build, be built out in order to satisfy the consumer demand and the business demand for these types of services. And long term also, how do you think about the relationship between 5G cellular signal and wireless broadband internet? We've kind of gotten used to jumping between, you know, bringing our laptops and our, and our tablets to Starbucks to connect to Wi-Fi there. But now there's more and more of a transition to 5G over those cellular networks. Does 5G gradually displace uh, wireless internet or even replace wireless internet over the long term? Or is this kind of a, a complementary new applications opportunity i think they go together um you know as we as we start to have uh, a more of a burden if you will in terms of the types of things that we're downloading uh and using on our handheld devices or our tablets we need multiple solutions um there's been so much written about 5g um and you know the at&t and verizon are spending you know voraciously on trying to get that coverage up um, but, you know, we think if you just focus on 5G, you're missing a much bigger story. You know, e-commerce, for example, we, I've just see, recently seen the statistics and the spike in e-commerce sales uh, as we're all locked down. And I think everybody thought it would get to 30% of all retail buying at some point, but it looks like it's accelerating. Well, again, we can't, can't do that without uh, these networks being built out, uh, not only on the technology side, but on the other side, on the distribution side. Um, Internet of Things, uh, artificial intelligence, all of those things are, I think, uh, as big or if not bigger than just 5G. And, and all of those different segments of the technology market are covered by the data centers, the fiber, net, fiber optic networks, and then the cell phone tower companies. 
Sure. And any overall thoughts about autonomous driving? We hear a lot about that in the news. And your perspective yeah. on self-driving cars? <laughs> Uh, my my personal opinion is it's going to be a long time before I get in one, but uh, <laughs> I think you know I think that you're, you'll see it evolve over time, and and as we start to prove out its effectiveness, and as people become more comfortable with the safety of it, um, I think it'll be a, you know become a bigger and bigger part. Um, you know I'm kind of a you know I know you're down in Texas. Uh, you know, I, and early in my career, I lived there. I drove all over Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma, and I'm kind of a be in control of my own car you know, explore the wide open spaces kind of guy. But in certain, uh, you know, bigger metropolitan markets to kind of, uh, you know, maybe deal with some of the congestion, I think you'll see more of this uh, as, as the technology ev evolves. And as we get more comfortable society, as a society with, you know, basically sitting in the back of a car with nobody up front steering except its connection to a cell phone tower that's transmitting all of this bits and bytes of information via a cell, you know, a fiber optic network to a computer someplace that knows where you're going to go and then sending the directions back. Yeah, it certainly makes a lot of sense in those densely populated areas. I can only imagine, though, in some parts of Texas, what it'd be like on the highways with a <laughs> autonomous car driving in front of you in the fast lane. Exactly. Uh, uh, Sean, let's shift gears a little bit on this, no pun intended with the car reference there, but Pacer ETFs, you know, we've talked a lot about 5G and data infrastructure, but you guys actually have a lot of different strategies, a variety of options and ETFs that are available for investors. I wanted to touch on just a couple of those real quick and get your kind of broader thoughts on why these are interesting strategies and why you're investing here. Uh, one sure. of them is, is the, uh, the ticker is PEXL. It's the, the Export Leaders ETF is what you're calling it, which is basically looks like they're deriving most of the sales from international markets, but also have high free cash flow yields for these companies. Can you talk a little bit about um, the strategy that you're using for that ETF? Well, you're certainly going to make my partner really happy uh, talking about Paxil because uh, he loves that strategy. The, the basic premise behind the story is that if you think about uh, companies in the U.S. and those that have the have a greater chance of being more profitable and grow faster, it's those companies that get the bulk of their sales outside the U.S. Because the U.S., although it is an enormous economy, it's only one economy throughout the world, and there are other economies growing more rapidly than ours. And there are markets to be, you know, to be you know, tapped into. So what we did with Pexel was we just basically screened the, screened the U.S. market for those who have the highest percentage of their overall sales outside the U.S. And then what we wanted to do is to try to put a fundamental or a, an economic screen on top of it so that we knew we were buying companies that were at least generating positive free cash flow. And so that's where the free cash flow yield uh, screen came in on that. And, you know, this is no secret, you know, maybe half of all the profits in the S&P 500 come from outside the U.S. So in this, you know, sort of globally interconnected world that we live in where, you know, we're not as open as we want in all cases on trade. Um, there is a great deal of, uh, of trade potential and, and commerce available outside the U.S. That, and uh, these larger companies, we think, are better suited to do that. And then those with free cash flow to spare can make investments in places to continue to grow their sales outside the U.S. as well. And we, we, what we hope is that eventually down the road that translates into a group of companies that have more profits than this just a broad-based S&P 500, let's say. And, and, and double-clicking on that a little bit farther, you have another ETF, GCOW, G-C-O-W. I love the ticker on that one, by the way. But it's Global Cash Cow, right? This is another um, index that is based upon high free cash flow margins, uh, which are also, and, and high free cash flow yields for that matter, too, that are paying a good portion of those out as dividends. Sean, how do you think about, uh, first of all, free cash flow, an unfamiliar term for maybe some of our audience, but it's basically the cash coming into the business after the business pays all of its operating costs and all of its capital costs, including that for future growth. So it's the cash that's hitting the bank after you pay for what you need to pay for. But how do you think about free cash flow? Um, especially from an international perspective, it seems like there's a lot of opportunity, uh, maybe temptation to expand aggressively to build out in other countries. You have to build a sales force, you have to build an infrastructure, you have to build yeah. a presence. I mean, it costs a lot of money to do that. Um, but then you've got another strategy that's looking for companies that are international that are paying that out as dividends rather than going out and expanding aggressively. How do you think about free cash flow and investing? Or is this something that truly is a, a company by company or industry by industry basis? 
Well, so we have a whole suite of what we call cash cows, which use free cash flow yield as the screen. So free cash flow yield is, if you wanted to think about it, if you were going to buy a company, what you would want to know is what you're paying in total to buy the company and then how much cash you would get as a result in terms of the cash would be generated once you purchase that company. So free cash flow yield is the free cash flow a company generates divided by its enterprise value. And the enterprise value is what you really pay. You pay for all the stock. And then you have to account for the debt and then you give the owner once you buy the company whatever cash is on the balance sheet back and then once you find that number say it's ten dollars if it's the you know if that if that company has five you know dollars worth of free cash flow then you're getting a ten percent free cash flow yield you're buying a dollar's worth of cash flow for ten bucks uh, that's a pretty good deal we think so we have a whole series of these that are all called cash cows we had fun with the tickers the us is cowz you mentioned g cow that's global we have international cash cows, that's iCow. We have a small cap version. If you have a small cow, you know this being in Texas, it's a cab. <laughs> so that's that ticker. And then we have a fun, to fun version, which as you know, being from Texas, if you have a whole bunch of cattle in a pen, it's called a herd. And so that ticker is H-E-R-D. And the, the premise is really simple. And you know, it's kind of a funny, uh, it's not funny, it's been interesting the last couple of years because um, high quality companies that generate a lot of cash and have high free cash flow yields, that look like they're solid, have good solid balance sheets and can continue to support their dividends. And by the way, use that free cash flow to grow and expand or maybe buy somebody. That type of investing uh, approach has not been really uh, rewarded over the last decade. It's all been growth, 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 growth. Uh, this growth versus value or growth versus quality cycle tends to change places over time, but we're way, way into a long-term cycle here with where growth is. Uh, outperform value or quality. Um, if we have a significant slowdown, uh, those companies that are positioned like the names in GCAL, which are high quality companies with high free cash flow, tend to do better coming out of that because they have the cash to withstand the downturn and they have the cash to be nimble and opportunistic coming out. So we're, we're big fans of the strategy. We're, we're a little bit disappointed that that investors, uh, you know, aren't paying much attention to it, but there will become a cycle here probably uh, coming up where this type of approach to investing will, will get rewarded. Um, and in the meantime, you're getting very attractive dividends to wait. You know, the, the dividend on GCAL, I think is north of 5%. The dividend on the US version is getting close to 3%. So if you have a long enough time frame and you want to buy high quality companies and collect some competitive and attractive dividends in the meantime, and you believe at some point that, you know, we're going to go through a cycle where those high quality companies are really rewarded for being what they are, which is good, solid, long-term investments. Um, the cows is a suite of products that we, we, we are pretty excited about going forward. Well, and I might have to buy in personally just because of all the Texas bovine references, which I really <laughs> appreciate being down here in Texas as well. Uh, Sean, it, one other ETF that you have is AFTY. This is yeah. one that's focused in China, some of China's largest companies. You've got Ping An, and they're a large uh, insurance company. You've got exposure to consumer staples and financials as well. A lot of headlines also about China right now, uh, a lot of political headlines about China right now. But from an investment perspective, what intrigues you about China the most? Uh, we, we partnered on this with uh, a Chinese asset management firm, CSOP. They had the product in the market for a while. Um, and we're not really able to get much traction and it's because they really didn't have a very big marketing uh, focus of the big team. We have a pretty big team here. And so we basically reorganized that fund into our, our trust. And our, our long-term premise uh, is that, you know, it's the second largest economy in the world. Um, and as an investor, you probably need to have some exposure to what's going on over there just because of the sheer size of, of their economy. Um, and, and because of some of the things that, that they're great at over there. Um, short term, it's been tough, you know, with what's going on with all of the, you know, you can call it politics or whatever you want to do in terms of trying to assess blame for the virus. Um, but um, what really attracts us more than anything uh, to the index, which is the A50 index, is that, uh, you know, the, 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 the skepticism on China is that we don't really get as much information, it seems sometimes, or maybe it's not as reliable as we want. However, the A50 are the 50 largest companies that are listed on mainland China. And those are the kind of names that big institutional investors tend to look forward, look to, to invest in. And so we feel like we can kind of ride the coattails of the big institutional investors here 
uh, with AFTY because of the 50 stocks that are in the index that it tracks. And, you know, they're ahead of us in terms of, you know, kind of moving out of the downturn. Uh, they're starting to see some real green shoots over there in terms of reopening their economy and getting things back to quote unquote normal. Um, and so for a diversifier, for a U.S. investor, you know, to, who needs to have some international exposure, I just, I think we've been underweight probably uh, China as an investment because of the way the big broad-based indexes allocate uh, to different countries. Um, they're the second biggest economy in the world. And I think they're like a 3% weight in some of the broader based indexes when they should be a much higher weight. And so if you wanted to kind of allocate capital based on GDP, you would have more money invested in China. And that's why we that's why we picked up the product, and that's why we long term we're looking at it as a good opportunity. Sure. And, and last question for you, Sean. You know, our audience here at Seven Investing is mostly retail investors, individual investors, not the institutions. But there's a lot of fear in the markets right now. We've seen a lot of volatility in the markets right now, a lot of uncertainty. And and you guys really have a, a very broad view of the markets. You know, several of the ETFs we just mentioned here. We talked about infrastructure, we talked about China, we talked about, you know, free cash flow internationally. Uh, what are a couple of key takeaways you would pass along to individual investors who might want to invest in the stock market right now? Uh, <laughs> you, you know, I, I think the stock market right now is being driven by a couple of things that are not traditional things that drive stock prices. I think it's being driven by narrative. In other words, the story is we're going to all get out of our houses one of these days and everything's going to go back to normal. Um, and the second thing is, is there's just no place else to put money. You can buy a bond and basically guarantee you make no return for the next 10 years. And so if, when, when those two things are working in your favor, uh, um, the market tends to go up. Um, at some point, uh, facts, fundamentals, real statistics, earnings, earnings growth, uh, all of those things are going to matter. They don't matter right now because we don't know what they are. We don't know what GDP is in the second quarter or what it's going to be. We don't know whether the 33 million people who lost their job are all going to get them back or whether only, you know, 25 of them are. We don't know, uh, you know, we don't know a whole lot. And so when those facts come out, what will interest me more than anything is whether or not they destroy the narrative. In other words, we're not going back to where we were and it's going to be a lot longer. You know, we have this nonsense talk about alphabets. Is it a V recovery? Is it an L? Is it a U? Is it a W? You know, Nobody really knows right now. So if I was, you know, a retail investor, the things I would be looking at would be number one, I'd want to buy high quality essential companies that are already past what's going on, like the data center names we talked about, for example. I'd want to own high quality companies that generate a lot of free cash flow. So, that, you know, if this does extend further, we at least know we're buying companies that have solid balance sheets and can sustain themselves, not have to go to the debt market in order to stay alive. Um, and I'd probably keep a little powder dry right now, just in case we get a chance to buy a little bit lower once the narrative is, you know, runs square into what the facts are and prices go lower in the short run again. Well, definitely some good advice there to follow the money and uh, that will confirm or destroy the narrative that's out there right now. Again, Sean O'Hara, the president of Pacer ETFs, $5 billion of assets under management up there in Malvern, Pennsylvania. Sean, really appreciate you joining me here this morning with Seven Investing. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it very much. Take care of yourself. Hope your family's safe. Absolutely. You as well. And thank you everyone for tuning in to this episode. We are here to empower you to invest in your future. We are 7investing.